Good evening. We're back. And my internet works again, so that's nice. How's everyone doing? I think tonight's going to be fun. This is one people have been asking for for a while. I see this kind of questions a lot in the Discord all the time. How do I write metal music? How do you make something sound like metal music? How do I write guitar parts? How do I write drums for metal music? So tonight we're just going to kind of cover all of that. And uh, I'll answer some questions as we go. Should be fun. How's everyone doing? We'll get started with this soon. Does anybody have any questions about like music production stuff? Just while I'm getting things set up. I am finishing up work on uh, the Sonic.exe song, Play With Me. Is the title we're going with for that? Because You Can't Run was already taken. <laughs> but uh, I think it'll be fun. I have a whole crazy music video I've been storyboarding for it. Now we're going to do full animation on it with like, I got some models for Sonic and Tails and Eggman, Knuckles. It's going to be going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I saw somebody mentioning in the chat earlier, can I do this with MIDI guitars? Yes, that is actually the plan today. I am actually going to use, I'm going to try to use all either stock stuff that comes with Ableton or uh, free VSTs I find online. Yo, Chewy, Chewy944, thank you so much for the super chat. You rock. So, let's jump into Ableton. And we'll just kind of talk through the general idea of what we're going to talk about here. Metal music is, um, hang on, I actually literally wrote, okay, good. <laughs> I wrote a little, little lesson plan for myself here. Okay, so metal music is defined by a few different things. First and foremost, the instruments we're going to be using. Uh, we know kind of what metal sounds like, right? We can, uh, do I have any metal songs I've had in here recently? Not really, but we can listen to some longest solo ever on Spotify. Okay, so the first thing you always think about is the guitars with metal, right? We've got distorted electric guitars, not clean electric guitars. Clean guitars sound totally different, almost like an acoustic guitar. These are big, crunchy, distorted guitars. We've also got a bass in there. You may not be aware of it, but there is a bass playing things under there. I'm trying to think of a song you might actually be able to hear it, hear it really well in. I don't know if I have any songs that have really prominent bass lines, actually. I guess Roses does, right? Right at the beginning. And this is interesting because this is playing a different part from the guitars. But really, in a lot of metal, you're going to be hearing the bass right in line with the guitars. We're going to go over exactly how we write that kind of stuff. Uh, is the bass distorted? Good question. Uh, sometimes and sort of. We will we will go over how that works. Uh, and then finally, we got the drums. Uh, the drums are big, huge, loud, powerful, punchy, uh, aggressive sounds. That is, Those are really the words we're using for all the instruments in metal. That is what we want to be talking about. So let's bring in each of those instruments into a session now. Uh, like I said, I am going to be using MIDI for all of this. These are all um, these are all actually free VSTs. 
Uh, so the drum kit we're going to be using is the MT Power Drum Kit. And you can just Google all of these and you will find them free. Oops, I didn't mean to put that on that track. There we go. Good, perfectly functional metal drum kit. Um, we have the... I forget that. There it is. Tercero! <laughs> Wonderwall lyrics, really? This is the Ample Bass P2 Lite. This is by Ample Audio. They make some really sick guitar VSTs. Um, and uh, we're going to be using their bass today. This is a free VST as well. And then finally, uh, this is one I literally found about five minutes before stream started. This is Lethality. Uh, and we'll be using this as well. Um, and we should probably find a free amp sim VST. Oh, we have Guitar Rig 6. Okay, cool, cool. We'll use that. I have that installed already. So, uh, let's talk about each of these elements and what they're doing, how we're going to use them. Uh, I've already talked a bit about drum programming in uh, the other tutorial I've done. So, I think we're actually going to start with, um, we're going to start with how to write guitar parts for metal and then work down from there in terms of... Uh, how we build this mix and this arrangement out because it really d it is going to start with the guitars for this when we're writing so i'm just going to write a little four measure thing and we'll talk about kind of what i'm thinking about and how it works while i'm writing so first let's get just some notes down from guitar uh let's pick a key Let's pick a key. Let's go with uh, D minor is always good for guitars. D minor's fun. So we can use Ableton's scale feature, actually. Can we? How do I do that? Maybe I can't use it. I've forgotten how to use this. Oh, scale. There we go. So I can give this a scale. We can go with D minor. And there we go. It's highlighted. And I can actually just fold it down to the scale if I wanted to, but that's going to throw me off because I'm not used to it. And let's write a little riff in D minor. Uh, when you're writing, there are two kinds of guitar parts we can write, two kinds of sections we can write. Uh, is that true? I helped make the guitar part in the first part in Uproar. Yeah, I played that part. I didn't write it, though. I flicky wrote it uh, and then sent me the MIDI for it, and I just played that MIDI on guitar. So, there are two concepts when it comes to writing metal guitar parts and writing metal music in general. You can write using riffs or you can write using chord progressions. And I use both of these a lot and you want to use both of these a lot. So, an example of a riff is uh, the, uh, the guitar part in Crazy that starts it off. It's almost this little melody. You can hear that's still going. That's a riff. It's a repeated, almost melody in the guitar and bass. But later in the song, we go to a chord progression. Right here. Just chords. It's a nice contrast. Back to the riff. Right? So, I need to close my email because that's going to annoy me. Can I go on do not disturb? Is that a thing on Windows? Yes. Good. Okay. So, there are riffs and there are chord progressions. Let's write a riff first. Let's write a little melodic idea. And I would like to hear this guitar part. Thank you. There we go. Okay. I've been in the wrong section. So let's write some riffs. That 
That's fun. Let's do it again. This does not sound like a metal guitar, right? And there's one big reason for that. It is not distorted. This is a clean guitar. This is what a guitar sounds like when you just plug it right into a computer. We need the sound of an amp. Uh, so we're gonna use Guitar Rig. Uh, guitar Rig is, well, it's not free, but it has a free version. And, oh, that's gonna scan a lot of things because I literally never use this plugin. This has Oh, cool, I can still use it. Okay, there's a free version of Guitar Rig that just gives you this one amp jump, but fortunate for us, that's a nice metal guitar amp. And you can just leave it right as is, it sounds fine. I'm still kind of learning what these do, to be honest. <laughs> that works. This is all actually sounding kind of high for me. So why don't we take this all down. Let's go to B minor instead. I like that. I didn't like that one note. All I'm doing is writing a little melody in the key that I wanna play in. I've done lessons on how to write melodies and stuff before, so I'm not gonna to go too deep into that. I'm just giving you the concepts of how to apply those concepts to metal, to writing metal. So, wrote a little melody in B minor, sweet. What do we do about the bass? We're gonna click here. We're gonna click copy. We're gonna click here. We're gonna click paste. We're done. <laughs> It's, it's an exaggeration, but honestly, if you want your songs to hit hard, you want your, your guitar and your bass to be locked together in time. It's, it's super helpful. Okay, now, sometimes different plugins will interpret octaves differently. Uh, so we are going to shift this down until it agrees with. There we go. Now let's listen to them together. Literally playing the exact same thing. Here's without the bass, it's just the guitar. And now everything. Yeah. What do you think? Should you learn your DAW's free VSTs or get better ones? Good question. So yeah, every DAW comes with free uh, like stock effects, like audio effects and plugins, not plugins, instruments and stuff. Uh, and then you can add in extra stuff from these plugins. I think you should use it all. I think you should absolutely know what everything in your DAW does. But for example, um, most DAWs don't come with a good uh, like bass instrument like a live bass sound uh, our bass and guitar are usually playing the same notes as the bass in the metal when they're playing riffs usually yes uh, we'll get into situations where the guitars are playing chords and the bass are not we're going to talk about that but if you're playing riffs it's nice to be all together uh, we will tell you what let's experiment what would it sound like if the bass wasn't doing that if the bass was just playing B this whole time. So I'm just gonna write eighth notes on B. Whoops. I can't draw a straight line there. Eighth notes on B the whole time. This is what the bass is playing now. 
How do I get Ableton for free and not the stupid free trial version? You pay for it, Whitmix. I'm sorry. That's how the world works. If you buy a MIDI controller, which you can find those for like 60 or 70 bucks, you buy a brand new MIDI controller that comes with Ableton Live Lite, you get a light version, which can do most of the things that the full version can do. Um, you, If you go to... Let's say the M Audio Oxygen. Like here's a MIDI controller. This is 179. There's cheaper ones though. Um, let's literally go through and find the cheapest MIDI controller we can find. And let's just see if any of them mention. I'm pretty sure the Keystation Mini might come with it. Nope. I'm just going to open a few of these till I find one that comes with Ableton, because they almost all come with Ableton. Bitwig? They're coming with Bitwig now? What? What is that nonsense? That's crazy. Bitwig? <laughs> What's with the Bitwig? There we go. The Alesis 100% has to come with. MPC Beats? No! Maybe they don't come with Ableton anymore. Hey, there we go. Okay. So this one comes with Ableton Live Lite. It's 109. It's the Novation Launch Key Mark III. It's a sick MIDI controller. Two octaves. A lot of nice buttons and stuff to press, too. Uh, integrates right with Ableton. It's 100 bucks, and you get a fully functioning version of Ableton. It doesn't have all the plugins and stuff, and you can only use eight tracks, but eight tracks is plenty to get started. And yes, you're right, audio interfaces also often come with Ableton. You're right, I forgot about that. Okay. What if our bass just played one note while our guitar played this riff? This could work too. And it's fine, but I think this hits harder. Right? These are both valid options, but this one gives me more of an indie rock vibe than like a metal thing, right? So we're not gonna use that. We're gonna use the metal one. Okay, now let's talk about drums. Drum programming is a tricky thing at times. Um, you kind of have to, oh, there's no scales in drums, so let's turn that off. Uh, this is unfortunately just something you kind of have to memorize, <laughs> the way drum programming works. Um, C, the ones you need to know are C1 is the kick drum, D1 is the snare drum, and F sharp one is your hi-hat. Those are the big three. So, a drum beat typically starts with snare drum on beat two and four, kick drum on beat one and three. Let's hear that. I'm just literally going to loop just the drums. And then we'll usually do hi-hat playing eighth notes, playing one and two and three and four and Right? And you don't have to do that. We could just do quarter notes like this. We can also play the hi-hat open, which is usually an A-sharp one. This works too. 
Or you can play it on the crash symbol. Or the ride symbol. These are all options of kind of varying intensity. But I'm going to start with eighth notes on the hi-hat. Actually, I was kind of feeling that open hi-hat. Let's listen to that with our guitar part. This is not the final version. I have something that's going to make it way better. It's a start. It's a start, right? But we notice something, right? You can't really hear the drums. What should we do if we can't hear the drums in this song right now? Any ideas? Yeah. Good. Good. Good coffee lemon. That's the right answer. Turn down the guitar. If someone said turn up the drums, that would be the wrong answer. When you're mixing, you want to turn things down to balance them. Much more so than cranking them up because you run out of headroom. You, you, you push everything to the ceiling and there's no room to go. But if you start turning things down to find balance, you get a nice, nice average balance and then you can crank it all up later. You think we should compress the drums? We'll get there. Compression, so, so I heard everybody saying limiter, uh, compression, absolutely. We're going to get to those things, but you don't want those to be your first lines of defense. First and foremost, you want to just be able to balance things with volume. You want to just be able to, to set volume levels so that the song fits together. Let's do that. Uh, I'm going to rename these. These are drums, bass, and guitar. I'm also going to make this bigger because it's kind of tiny, right? There we go. That's better. Okay. Okay. So we got drums, bass, guitar. Let's turn our guitars down. Bass, too. Cool. It's not bad. All right. Now, there's something I'm curious about. Uh, when we get to the mixing section, I'll talk about that. Okay. Um, NX, do I ever do a uh, sidechain in metal music? Yeah, all the time, actually. But I make very, like, dancey metal music. I mean, like, if you listen to Crazy, like... There's sidechain all over that. Same with, like... Uh, I mean, it's the same song, but Doll Wars has it much more intensely. Very dancey. So there's side chain all over the guitars on that, actually. Uh, do you ever use it in like a less dancey form? Yeah, you can totally use it to get it out of the way of the kick drum. Uh, if you side chain the guitars to the kick, it can really help the kick punch through the guitar parts better. Um, but that's like some advanced stuff. Okay. So this is fine. This works. It's honestly kind of really boring as far as the drums go, right? So we're going to try something else. I'm going to set up a new one over here. We're going to write a new drum part. Remember how we made the bass part? What's the best BPM? There is no best BPM. Don't ever uh, let someone tell you there's a best BPM for something. The best BPM for the song is what you feel is good. Uh, people get, who get really hung up on like, oh, dubstep isn't dubstep unless it's exactly 144.3 BPM. Uh, if it's any faster than that, it's actually drum step. Like, I hate that stuff so much. Just make good music set at the speed you want it. Okay, here's how we write drums for metal. We take our guitar part, our bass part, whichever, because they're all the same, right? We're going to copy. We're going to paste it into the drums. 
<laughs> this sounds crazy, right? Because it's going to sound like this. That's not right. That can't be right at all. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn off that scale again. Yeah. We are going to make each one of these hits that we have here kick drums. We got to move them all down. And I got to nudge these around until they're all kicks. There might have been a faster way to do this, but I don't know what it is. Okay. Now we have a kick drum part that matches our guitar and bass. Cool. Now we just put the rest of a drum beat in. We put snare on two and four. You can already hear it's got a lot more life to it, right? We're going to add in our open hi-hat. That was A sharp one. We're going to put that on every quarter note. One, two, three, four. Right? And finally, I tend to delete the kick drum where there's already a snare hit. Uh, in most situations, I don't like them hitting at the same time unless I'm specifically doing a dance beat, which we won't go over here because it's not really that metal. Let's compare that to the regular drum beat, like the basic rock beat we did over here. They both work. They're both their own thing. I tend to like the kick drum that's really synced in with the rest of the instruments a lot better. You plan how fast the chart is going to be, and then you do the BPM. Are you making charts or are you making songs? I approach it as a musician, like from the point of view of a musician, because it's a music game, right? I don't like that at all. I'm sorry. Are you meant to have both normal notes and sharp notes? Okay, that is getting into some like basic music theory stuff. All you need to know is you can set a scale. Don't worry, like there is nothing inherently different about sharp notes, flat notes, natural notes is the word for notes that aren't sharp or flat. It is just that there are 12 keys that you can work with. C major, D sharp major, you know, you know C major, C sharp major, D major, D sharp major, and so on. One for every note of the scale. Uh, there's 12 keys you can work in and each of them have a different arrangement of sharp notes, flat notes, natural notes, etc. Don't worry. There's nothing like sharp notes aren't inherently different from natural notes. That's all. We just happen to be writing in B minor for this one. We could just as easily play this in A minor. And in A minor, there are literally no sharps or flats. It's all natural notes. But I like how this sounds in B minor. Uh-oh, I did something wrong. I broke something. <laughs> I still don't really know how this... Uh... I don't know how this... This plugin works. I'm sorry. Okay. I appear to have fixed it. I don't know what I did. <laughs> Thank you. 
Like I said, I literally downloaded that plugin uh, uh, moments before this stream. Okay. That is a metal riff. That's how we write a metal riff, right? Uh, but I also mentioned there's chord progressions too. You can have chord progressions in metal. Uh, Michael, I'm done doing covers. No more. I'm bored of them. Okay. Let's talk chord progressions. Just to review what chord progressions are, in every key, there is a chord for every note. So if we're in the key of B minor, the notes are B. Should I not be writing here? There we go. I should be writing there. Okay. The notes are B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G, A, and then we're back around to B. There are seven chords in this key. They are B minor, C sharp minor, or C sharp diminished, D major, and, and so on. The way we build the chord, let's talk about that. I feel like I'm flying through stuff here, I'm sorry. Okay, building chords is super, super, super simple. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about, you said when you make chords from metal guitars, it sucks. We're gonna talk about why. Um, but first, the concept of building chords is very straightforward. You have a root note, the, the note the chord is named for, right? We have B minor. It's the first chord in the key of B minor. The way we build a chord is you play the root note, you skip over a note, you play the next note. You skip another note, and then you play one more note, and we've got a chord. It sounds kind of weird though, right? And that's because you don't actually, you wouldn't typically play chords like that on a guitar, because the way they fall on the guitar just sucks. You have to play them like this. Like it's literally this like crazy stretchy pretzel chord to play a normal three note chord stacked like that. So on guitar, especially in metal and in rock, when we're working with distorted chords, we tend to play what are called power chords. And a power chord is this same thing without the middle note. It sounds like this. And already you recognize that sound, right? That is, that is the sound of like rock guitar parts. So we will often just play power chords like this. Uh, let's play them as eighth notes. Cool. Now let's pick a chord progression. Uh, let's do, remember we can use any of the notes in this scale as a root for the chord. Uh, let's do B and then G. I'm gonna do one in each measure. So we have one measure here. One, two, three, four. Then we're on measure two. Two, two, three, four. Measure three, three, two, three, four. And then measure four over here. Uh, it's just occurring to me that the screen is a little too large. So I'm gonna shrink it down here. Hopefully y'all can still see it. Add the octave for the root note. Yes, coffee. I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. Uh, so we have G. And then how about A. And then F sharp for our last one. So we're going to build our chords the same way. If you want, you can just skip over one, two, three notes to get to the last one. This distance of notes is called a fifth because we move five scale degrees between them. So like A, B, C, D, E, A, E is a fifth. You always want to count five letters, including the first one. So G, G, A, B, C, D is a fifth. And that's a power chord. A power chord is a fifth. We're going to do the same thing, A, B, C, D, E. 
And finally, F, G, A, B, C sharp. And we have... That's a chord progression, right? And yes, as some people have mentioned, you will sometimes have an extra octave on top of the power chord. Like this, you have B, F sharp, and then B on top. It's a really subtle difference, I'll be honest. I'm gonna leave them off because honestly, I like the sound of just the root and the fifth. And that's the start, right? What are we gonna do for the bass part? We're gonna start the same way. We're gonna copy it, and we're gonna paste it to our bass part. And you can see it comes in so much higher than the bass, so we're gonna have to move it down. But bassists generally play only one note at a time, in most styles at least. And they're gonna play the root of the chord, the, the note the chord is named after. So they're not gonna play the fifth up here. Let's get rid of that. So we're just getting rid of the higher note in each of these power chords. And now we just have the root note, which is great. And I'm just gonna move it down until it's in the same octave as the other stuff. And there we go, bass line. Now, as for the drums, we could go the same way, right? We could have uh, the kick drum playing on every single kick, like uh, on every single guitar hit, like we did before. That's actually gonna feel pretty exhausting, I'll be honest. That's not a kick drum. Oh, there we go. Like this, like you could do this. But honestly, that, that feels like a waste. And here's where we get into writing like actually fun kick drum patterns. You still typically wanna have a kick drum on one, at least in the first measure to start things off. It, it stabilizes things right there. Um, and then you can kind of place your other kick drums, just experiment a little. I tend to like this pattern. Uh, this is like an old like pop punk kick drum pattern. So we can get something like this. Remember that snare drum and the hi-hat is like your, that's like your metronome. It's your timekeeper. It never changes, almost never. There's always exceptions. But your kick drum is where you get to have fun with this stuff. I feel like I need more kick out of this, so I'm gonna go into the mixer for the drum kit plugin and turn it up a little. It's nice. It's a nice free little plugin. All right, we have two sections of a song here already, right? We have our riff that we wrote. And then we have our chord progression. Right? Uh, I play piano, but I want to learn electric guitar. Are there any similarities between the two? Yeah, I mean, they're both chord instruments. They're both uh, polyphonic, meaning they can play multiple notes at once. They're both technically string instruments, too, which is fun. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, any concepts you've learned of, like, reading music and chords and notes and timing all translates. Uh, it's a little different in that guitar is kind of setting up the notes with one hand and then playing them with the other. But... Uh, but yeah, you can absolutely learn it. 
So yeah, we've got what, like Tercero said, we basically have verse and chorus. So let's do that. Let's build a structure off this. And I'll start marking these. Here's our verse. And then our chorus. Here we go. And then we go back. Cool. That's the basics right there. There's plenty more we can add to this to uh, to take this to the next level, right? Starting with uh, what I think are really helpful are drum fills. Isn't piano a percussion instrument? Yeah, it's, it's kind of both a percussion instrument and a uh, string instrument. You're not wrong, Spike. Um, <clears throat> technically, it's in its own family of instruments called the clavichord family, I believe. But yeah, since the strings are struck with hammers inside the piano, you could call it a percussion instrument. Uh-oh, my voice is going. That's not good. It did that yesterday, too. Okay, let's talk about drum fills. Drum fills are a kind of fun little connective tissue in between uh, different sections that the drums get to do. Uh, drums are kind of the punctuation of a song in that they, um, drum fills are like the punctuation at the end of a sentence. It's like the period or a question mark or an exclamation mark saying, hey, this sentence is done, time for a new idea. And they'll usually happen at the end of a section. So here we have, I'll merge these. So we have our full verse one section here. Yo, thank you, LDG. LDG, thank you so much for like the sales pitch on that. You rock. <laughs> You're amazing. Uh, and, and yeah, like LDG said, you get access to all kinds of cool stuff. You get to hear any songs I'm working on way early. We have like a secret patron discord and the, anyone at the longest fan ever, uh, membership level gets in too. Um, and you just get to hear like everything I'm working on behind the scenes stuff, all kinds of secret fun stuff early. It's fun. I'm revamping all my patron and membership stuff soon. Um, but if you get in now, you get like some really cool stuff. You rock LDG. Okay, so let's put a drum fill at the end of this part, like right here. It's gonna be really simple. I'm gonna delete these last two beats of stuff. So here, there's just like nothing there now. And I'm gonna make this super simple. We're gonna do four hits on the snare drum, and then four hits on a tom. Let's hear the last couple measures now. You can hear it just gives like some extra extra energy there, right? Let's listen to it again. And it works. Cool. So if drum fills are the punctuation at the end of a sentence, crash symbols are capitalizing the first letter of a sentence. Let's take this very first hi-hat hit and we're going to move it to the crash instead. And the reason we're not doing both is because all the cymbals on a drum kit are played with the drummer's right hand. When you're programming drums, it's so helpful to be thinking like an actual drummer, which is why it's really helpful to watch like just some drum lesson videos, like actual live drum lesson videos, so you get an idea of where your hands are as a drummer. Because when you're a drummer, you can't have your right hand on both the hi-hat and the crash cymbal. So we're gonna move that imaginary hand from the hi-hat up to the crash like this. 
we're going to do it in this part too. So you can hear it going from the fill into... Let's hear that again. Listen to how smooth this goes. Right here. And there's one thing we can do to make this even smoother. We're now in the chorus. We're in a new section of the song, right? We've got hi-hat going. Let's move that to the ride cymbal instead. So now let's hear this transition. Check it out. Now it's working, right? Right? We've got a drum fill leading out of the first section, a crash cymbal on the first beat of the chorus, and then we move our right hand from the open hi-hat to the ride cymbal instead. Uh, did I ever use Easy Drums? Yes, absolutely. Easy Drummer was my first like drum sequencer, my drum sam my first drum sampler that I ever bought. Uh, then I used Superior Drummer later. Now I mostly use Get Good Drums, uh, like Get Good Drums Invasion GGD stuff is really good. Uh, you also asked how I fry scream earlier. Um, that is uh, check out Chris Liepe, Chris Lipe on YouTube, L I E P E. Uh, I just watched all his videos. I took some lessons from him. I took some lessons from uh, someone he works with, Lucas Magyar, who's the singer of Veil of Maya, and he's my voice teacher now. I take monthly lessons with him, uh, and he's really helped me with fry screaming. Let's do another drum fill here. Drum fills do not have to be complicated. They just have to be different from whatever's happening. So we're going to do... Uh, these can be eighth notes, actually. We're going to make the drummer go snare and floor tom at the same time. Boom, and then kick. Boom, kick. This kind of sounds like knuckles. What do you mean? There's our drum fill. Let's listen. Oh, let's go back to Crash here. And there we go. You only use a free software to make music. Uh, are there any good, simple, really cheap options? I mean, Reaper is basically free. Uh, Reaper is has an infinite free trial. Uh, you can absolutely start there. So we've got drum fills. We've got crash cymbals at the start of every section. This sounds like a song, right? This is working for me. What guitar sound fonts do I use? Uh, normally I use a sound font called my actual hands on a guitar. Um, but right now I'm using Lethality, which is a free uh, guitar VST running through Guitar Rig 5 Jump, which is also free. Uh, the bass is Ample Bass P Lite, and the drums are MT Power Drum Kit 2. All of these are free. Uh, and I'm, I'm using, yeah, literally all free things right now. Haven't even touched the stock plugins in Ableton, which means you could do all of this in any, uh, any DAW, any program you want, using these free VSTs. So... We've got that. That's pretty cool. What else we got? What else can we do? There's some fun stuff we can do with uh, the drums. Besides just playing these fills and stuff, we can also change up the drum beat by changing what the snare does. Check this out. We're going to do something called halftime. Halftime is a really fun trick 
you can pull with the drums. We're just going to call this the halftime chorus. And you can do this halfway through a part. You can do this wherever you want, whatever you want. LDG, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the super chat, LDG. And sweet, I will check out that DM. Have a good night. And good luck working on those videos. Sounds awesome. LDG's working on some really cool animation stuff. Uh, okay, so check this out. We're going to do halftime on these drums. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this fill because we'll probably write a new one there. And I'm actually going to get rid of all the snare drums. So remember, we were writing snare on beats two and four. It sounds like this, right? Let's get rid of all the snare drums. And we're just going to put the snare drum not on two and four, where it's happening every two beats, right? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. What if we made it twice as long in between those? One, two, three, four, right? Um, we're going to put it on beats three only. We're going to listen to our original chorus over here. This is a regular, full-time, regular time drum beat. And now, the halftime beat. It sounds so heavy. All we changed was where the snare drum was. Listen again. Half time. We can go the other way. Check it out. Let's do the second half of this, not in half time, but in double time. So we used to do two and four. We can just literally put it on the and of every beat. Now to make that work, we're probably gonna have to change up the kick and snare a little bit, or the kick and uh, and the cymbals. Right here. Right? So all we're doing is changing where the snare lives and it has this immense effect on things. We'll leave it as halftime. That was sounding pretty cool. How to make those emotional chord progressions in metal songs? What do you mean, Dan Dog? Uh, give me, give me more specific stuff. Because emotion in in music is so. Uh, there's no like instant shortcut to it. That's not true. Secondary dominants are totally an instant shortcut to it, but I don't have time to explain secondary dominance. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know where you can find good instruments to make songs all instruments are good Rodrigo believe it or not it's um, it's real easy when you get started making music uh, to get hung up on like oh I don't have the right sounds I don't have the right synths I don't have the right samples I am literally using all free instruments here and we've got something pretty cool sounding I just Googled free guitar VST and downloaded the first thing I saw. Same with free bass VST and free drum VST. And it's working, right? It's working pretty well. Cool. All right, let's talk about mixing and mastering and all that other fun stuff. Uh, you can layer other instruments on top of here, of course. Uh, like for example, let's grab, uh, we will continue on using uh, free stuff. I'm gonna use stuff from the Contact, uh, the Complete Start factory library. Uh, and I'll try to just use ones that are in I don't remember if it comes with strings or not, but I'll try to use just like the easy strings maybe. Yeah. 
Do you think people should search up the notes of scales and practice making songs based on them or experiment and learn it slower but entirely by themselves? Uh, it's a tough question. The real answer is I think everyone should learn music theory. And I have a really cool, easy course uh, on how to learn the basics of music theory in like the most fun way possible coming up in like a couple months. But uh, for now, there is Teoria.com. You can always go there. Um, they have some great music theory lessons. Uh, but yeah, I do think people should work based on scales rather than just trying to like, you know, kind of earball it. And uh, if the built-in stuff like the scale snapping tool in here works, there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah, you should eventually learn to build those scales yourself without relying on that. Like I never use those personally. Um, I'm going to add just like some violins playing this chord progression from the guitar part. And here we get into, um, this kind of sounds really annoying. This is what we call the machine gun effect in music production, where it sounds like just, just overly like identical. Super annoying, sounds like a Super Nintendo in not in a good way. Um, and what we could do to change that is vary up the velocity. So if you think about the way a musician plays, they're not always playing every note exactly the same volume. Uh, and sometimes we get into these patterns of volume. So one of the patterns I like is this loud, soft, soft. And I'll just repeat it for the whole measure. Loud, soft, soft, loud, soft, soft, loud, soft. And then the measure's over and we're going to start the pattern again. But let's listen to what it sounds like. That's pretty cool. I'm going to save myself some time by just copying that because I already did the velocity adjustments. Let's hear that mixed into the rest of this stuff. Let's name this strings. Uh, and we're going to color code these, which is funny because I'm colorblind, but hey, whatever. Uh, every instrument has a correct color for it, and these are mine. Yours may be different. So I'm just going to loop the chorus and find a balance for the strings. I'm going to turn them down first. Oh, I forgot the chord progression. That's what happened there. <laughs> and yes, it uh I mean it doesn't have to follow the exact same chords. There we go. There we go. That's much better. Uh, can I send a link to the music theory site? Yes, absolutely. It is teoria.com. You can do the tutorials, you can do the exercises, it's all very good stuff. So like I said, you can stack instruments on top of here, have fun. But we're gonna move into the mixing stage. Do you ever use chords from outside the key? Yes, those are called borrowed chords, and they are uh, they are a dangerous dark magic. <laughs> no, you can, you can absolutely try it. Uh, they may sound cool, they may not sound cool. There are certain rules as to uh, what'll like guarantee them sounding cool. But that is a uh, that is for another lesson because that's some really complicated music theory stuff. Okay, so folks mentioned compression earlier. Uh, and yeah, we can talk about compression. We can talk about uh, limiters. But basically what a compressor does, it takes the loud parts and the soft parts and it squishes them together so you get one more compressed dynamic range. Uh, it's not too loud. It's not too soft. It's all kind of just punchy and right in, in between. And then you can take that more compressed range and push it up so it's louder. So let's start with the drums on that. 
I have a whole lesson on how to use a compressor on my channel. Well, technically it's on Dean Talks Music, but if you just uh, look on my channel page and go down to the, the music lessons, you'll see how to use a compressor. Or you could just search like longest solo ever compressor and it'll probably come up. But basically I'm taking this line, the threshold, moving it below these peaks It's just adding a little punch to things. Cool. The bass does not need much. Someone asked if I ever distort bass. I do. Let's take a listen to how I distort bass. What BPM? Uh, no, don't. Don't use a specific BPM shift box. I already ranted about this earlier. People who say there's a correct BPM for any type of music don't know what they're talking about use the bpm the song wants it to be uh what's better a limiter or a compressor they're different tools it's like asking what's better a knife or a food processor um like one's more powerful than the other but you wouldn't uh throw a nicely cooked steak in a food processor you know <laughs> is ott a good compressor ott is its own thing ott is not what i would consider just a compressor uh, OTT is a, um, a crazy thing you can do to your mix, and <laughs> we'll get to that another time. Okay, so distortion adds, for lack of a better word, more stuff, more information. It takes the little tiny bits of sound in an overall tone, and it kind of like raises the the little bumps along the way you can see how there's sounds there that weren't there before right and it sounds like crap <laughs> but we want to introduce a little bit of distortion to this so let's find uh I have no idea what these are. I've never used them. Let's see, pedal. That's kind of cool, actually. Okay, so now we have a really crappy sounding bass, right? Speed core has to be over. See, I hate sentences like that, Dan Dog. That just like, the second you say that, you're putting music in the weirdest box. Just like, just write music you like, you know? Okay, so we've got this distorted, farty-sounding bass. We're going to take this dry-wet knob, <laughs> and we're going to take it from a wet fart. <laughs> we're going to take it from the wet signal, which is the fully affected tone that this, this, uh, this effect is doing. Dry is nothing. Dry is off. And I'm going to mix in just a tiny bit of it. Do you hear how little I'm using? Here's without it. And with. Do you hear how there's just a little shimmer up there? Let's try that in the mix. I actually kind of want a bit more now that I'm hearing it in the mix. Tercero, thank you. When will I end? Probably in about an hour, I'm guessing. That's sounding pretty cool. And thank you for the super chat, Tercero. Do organs sound good with metal music? I don't know. Try it. Totally depends. Do I ever split the bass? That's actually kind of what I'm doing here, believe it or not. Uh, but yes, I will totally do like a split chain where I have two different sounds affecting the bass. Uh, but this dry wet knob is actually doing that, believe it or not. It's splitting it uh, like 
82% unaffected and 18% affected, and then mixing them back together. Yeah, I like that. Now let's go to the guitars. So there's something um, there's something you'll hear me saying often is that I always double track my guitars. And what that means is, um, I'm actually literally gonna do it for you right now, just because it's so easy and I literally have a guitar right here. So, I'm gonna record two guitar parts. Goofed up my own riff. I've never played it on guitar before, though. It's only existed for a few minutes. Okay. Now I'm going to track it again. I'm going to play that exact same thing. but incorrectly. I could do that better. One more try. Okay. So, here is what one guitar sounds like. And here is that exact same part tracked twice, it's two separate takes, left and right, panned into the ears. Take a listen. If you have headphones on, you're really going to hear this. So much bigger, right? Sounds huge. So we need to do that with our guitar part, because right now it sounds tiny. It sounds right in the middle. Did it feel weird recording guitar in Ableton? Yes. I never do that. Yes, that's a super standard thing. They are panned 100% left and right. That's very standard in any kind of rock or metal um, uh, tracking. Uh, you always double track uh, the guitars. So let's figure out how to do that for this guitar. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as just duplicating the track and panning one left to right, right? Because we're going to listen to that. Oh, damn. This actually does a really good job of it. Never mind. I'm wrong. Normally, you wouldn't be able to just duplicate it and pan it left and right. You have to have two separate guitar performances, right? Um, <laughs> this actually does a really good job of randomly playing enough notes that uh, it just sounds like two performances. Check it out. That's it. Okay, so with this one, it happens to actually double track your guitars. Not all of them will do that. You mean you may need to find a way to make the performance seem different, whether it's by shifting it a little bit forward or back in time or changing some settings. Um, I know stuff like Shreddage Hydra actually has a double tracking setting that lets you, that'll just do it for you. And this this does too, apparently. Pretty sweet, I like this plugin. It's called Lethality, it's totally free. It's crazy. Let's listen to that. Pretty sweet. All 
Okay, the last thing I usually do on a mix uh, is I will throw a limiter on the master channel. I don't know I'm looking for. I usually just search. I'll grab a limiter and throw it here. And someone mentioned OTT earlier. We can use OTT. Uh, OTT is actually just a preset for the multiband dynamics plugin in Ableton. Um, and it, by default, it really messes up your mix, in my opinion. Here's what it sounds like. I don't think that sounds good personally. But if we take the amount and crank it all the way down and just mix it in a little. I think it can be kind of nice. And now. I'll turn this up until I start to see some action in the gain reduction meter. This is like limiting. This is how much limiting is actually happening. What a limiter does is, what exactly is limiting? Yeah, so let's talk about this. Um, handy dandy paint. Okay. When you're playing music, let's say you're, you're making sounds and they go like this. You play a big note, you play a big loud note, and then you play a quieter note, and then, you know, whatever. Cool? This is your sound. This is volume. The higher we are, the louder we are. A compressor... Well, actually, let's start with a limiter. A limiter is really easy. A limiter, you set a line and you say, Hey, I don't want it any louder than this line. And when you do that... Your um, there we go. Your sound wave, then, looks like this instead. It stops here. It doesn't get any louder than that. That is all a limiter does. A compressor is different from a limiter in that a compressor still has this line. It says, hey, we'd really like it not to get louder than that. But if it does, we understand. Just try to keep it down. And so the volume might end up somewhere more like here, depending on how hard you set the compressor. But a limiter says, no, you're not going above that. That's it. And what happens as a result, if you can imagine, let's say we have a drum beat that goes, you know, or whatever. Good beatboxing there. And we set a limiter here. Now, all of a sudden, think about what happens in a drum hit after you hit it. It's the sound of it bouncing around the room. It's the sound of the snare wires under the snare rattling. It's the sound of the, the, the drum itself reverberating, right? All of that sound that's normally kind of quiet compared to the initial hit, now it's exactly as loud as the initial hit. It's all the same. And so you hear this big smack and then you hear as the room sound rushes in to fill the space left by the limiter. And that's why limiters and compressors can make things sound so punchy and strong because it takes the parts of a sound, not just like the hits themselves, but the parts within the hit that are normally quieter, and it brings them up to the forefront. It makes things sound really punchy. So we're gonna use this limiter, and like I said, I'm gonna push it until it hits, uh, until we start seeing actual activity in this gain reduction meter. There it is. And sometimes I'll do a bit of EQ work before the limiter. Actually, usually before OTT. If I feel like maybe the mix is kind of annoying me in some uh, in some specific spots, like frequency-wise, um, I will 
pull up an EQ, and I'll just boost random parts until I find the part that's really getting on my nerves. Let's try that. It's actually this. Oh, I hear a little more up here. Hang on. Right there. Listen to that. I hate that. Let's listen to what we did. We turn it off. And back on. That's pretty good. Off. And back. Oh, hey, Marstar Bro. What's up? <laughs> How you doing? And that's pretty much my approach to mixing and mastering metal. pretty sweet I want to now show you kind of how I approach it with thing that I have and with real guitars just so you can kind of hear how this works uh, so this will be the free version of the song and then we'll do this again I'm gonna start by copying all my drum MIDI to here, and we're going to put my nice paid samples in here. This is Invasion. This is my go-to drum kit for everything. And we're going to use Euro Bass for the bass. Uh, actually, I have one that's pre-driven. It's just what it sounds like. How close does that sound? I'm curious to the free one. I mean, it's a totally different sound, but it doesn't sound that much worse. Also, I'm going to move these to here. Okay. Cool. Let's put some actual guitars on this. Record the guitar riff. Again, maybe I can play it right. Cool. We record it again. That's all we need. We duplicate. We pan it to the left and right. Now we got some chords to play.
Let's compress these drums. Change my mind. I want to use this compressor. There we go. I'm doing the exact same thing I did with the other one, just different tools. Here's one last thing I always do with my guitar parts. Uh, this isn't the method I usually use, but we are going to, uh, either I would take the time to like really get this tracking perfect, but we're gonna save that time. I just want all of these right on beat. So I'm just gonna grab everything and quantize it. And I can just quantize the audio right to the beat. Can you do that in FL Studio? I don't think so. Certainly not as easily. Anyway, that's done. Sweet. And then I'm just gonna go through, and these little breaks in between, check it out. These little breaks, I don't want any sound there, so we're just gonna get rid of them. It's gonna sound a lot cleaner, check this out. Check out how far that goes, right? Let's get each of these breaks. Radio, this is actually not Pro Tools. This is Ableton Live. It's true, I can't stop dissing, dissing FL Studio, I'm sorry. If it would stop being so bad, I'd go easier on it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> The FL21 beta, I have not checked it out yet. I am curious. This plugin always takes forever to load. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. It's worth it, though. It sounds awesome. Uh, I want to use... my favorite guitar I own, it's the black Carvin. It's always the seven string Carvin. So let's listen. We've got our free version. And our paid version. Back to the free. Back 
to the paid. Free one sounds pretty solid. I'll be honest, the biggest difference is the fact that I'm using live guitars. That really is it. Like we could, um, if I threw these live guitars in there, even with a free amp simulator, it would it would probably do the trick. Uh, like check this out. So if I take this guitar apart, no matter what, just um, guitar. Wow, it really didn't like me copying and pasting that. Okay, there we go. Um, no matter what, sampled guitars just still quite don't quite get there. There's a couple I've heard that get scary close, um, but they're by and large not there yet. Uh, but amp sims are great, so let's grab that free amp simulator. We're gonna toss it on each of these guitars. We'll listen to our guitars with that free amp sim. And listen. Yeah, the paid amp sim sounds better, of course. But free one's pretty good. not bad if I went on a solo guitar tour I would love to go on a solo guitar tour I was just thinking about that the other day like how I could possibly make that work It'd be a lot of fun uh yeah so that's the general concept there does anyone have any questions about writing metal music producing metal anything like that oh yeah we could do a melody Let's do a melody on the free version. Uh, we'll make this a guitar melody because I don't feel like writing Friday Night Funkin' vocals anymore. And let's see how writing melodies for this thing actually feels. Hey, later, radio. Uh, usually when I'm writing melodies, I slow it down so I can write. Any tips for writing me metal melodies and riffs? Same as anything else, honestly. Like, the best metal melodies are basically just pop song melodies. Stay in key, emphasize the chord tones, the same as anything else. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of hard to write um, like instrumental melodies to riffs. Riffs are much better like sung over, which is why I guess Friday Night Funkin' vocals work on them. But if we like had vocals to this, like singing, singing to this, this would probably work. But we could totally put a melody over this chord progression. That's doable. It works. Yeah, 
Yeah. You hear some versus LSC in this. Uh, there's not really. Certainly not versus LSC week two. <laughs> Longest all over week two is going to blow your minds. We're going to have teasers for it soon. We're working on it. All the music's done. Almost all the music's done. I have like two more quick songs to write. But all the main stuff's done. Her little gain stage and that. Yeah, I mean, I have I have habits as a composer. Um, every composer does. You'll hear similarities between songs they write. It's usually not conscious. It's just that we have we have specific ways we approach certain chord tones, and it's it's always a uh, it's always a, f- a few of the same things. So, yeah. Any more questions? I like just hanging out, talking about music stuff. You're working on songs that need that anime feel, and you'd like to know how to make those cool chord progressions. You're desperate. Okay, I can give you a little bit of a cheat code. Just the tiniest one, all right? Uh... Trying to think of the best way to explain this. Okay. You can borrow chords from other keys. These are called secondary chords or borrowed chords, uh, secondary harmony. Um, And what this means is... (laughs) I'm trying to find the best way to approach this. Because it sucks without like a lot of music theory knowledge. Okay. Let's write a chord progression where we want to get from a B chord to a D sharp chord. I'm trying to think. Uh, is that the best example for this? That might work. Let me test something. No. Okay. This kind of. I'm not going to be able to explain it well. I'm sorry. Here's something you can do. If you want to get to a chord, you could play the same chord before it, but take the root note and move it down a half step. Only the root note. Does that help? Oh, pan it back. Sorry, yeah. So if you want to go to a chord and you want to use something kind of out of the box to get there, you know the chord you want to end up on? You play that same chord just before it, but you move only the root down a half step. And this works going anywhere. Check it out. If we wanted to go to uh, C sharp from here, doesn't matter if it's out of key. And you could do it over and over again. You get this like staircase effect. Check it out. Here is the trick when writing with these, this weird chord is a G-sharp major chord. So it's a major chord built on the top note of what you're playing for some music theory mess around reasons. You don't like how it works, how it it sounds too OP? Hear it in like the context of like an actual, um, of an actual song, check this out. So like I'll play it with the nice guitars and stuff.
what was the hardest Friday Night Funkin' song to cover? Triple Treble. Uh, it was it was a week of pure pain. It's an awesome song, but transcribing that gave me nightmares. <laughs> Uh, we're kind of cheating around actually playing these chords. That's what's really happening. Oops, I goofed. You can play both. You can mix and match. And because we're using more interesting uh, chords there, it actually gives you a lot of interesting places you can go with the melody for it if you want it to. Uh, so like, I just made a lead sound, hang on. Um, so we're doing, okay, I figured it out. So it could sound like this. Are we in B still? Do I not know what I'm doing? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> well, it sounds cool. Anyway. <laughs> Weird note to end that on, but that is um that is how that is one way to get what I think the sound you're looking for uh of the the secondary dominant these like emotional anime chords. But yeah, look up like look up the chord progressions to these songs and steal them. Here's the thing, once you learn a chord progression to a song, you can use it anywhere. Um and it's really important to think of these chord progressions not as just absolute values of B, G, A, F sharp. That doesn't help anybody when you're writing a song in the key of C minor, right? But all you do is take those concepts and you move them to C instead. And now you've got the same chord progression. It's just in a different key. This is why um, music producers, musicians, think of things not in terms of absolute notes, but often in terms of numbers. So in the key of B minor, B is 1, C sharp is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this chord progression is not B, G, A, F. It's one, uh, one, six, seven, five. And I can do one, six, seven, five in any chord progression, in any key. It's really helpful to start thinking of music like that. Anyway, Tercero, are you ready to hop on? Go have some fun. So we're going to go hang out on Tercero's stream over on Twitch and play some Geotastic, which I think will be fun. I've never really played before. I'm probably going to be really bad at it, but I'll be on Tercero's stream. It's going to be fun. 
So that is how to write metal. <laughs> That's all I got on that. Uh, what else do you all? What else do y'all want to see in terms of like streams and concepts and stuff and video tutorials? I want to do more of that. I'm having fun with this. That was a lot of fun. Right now, I kind of like that riff. I like how that came out. Can we get a Sonic Drowning riff? Why? Teach how to make beat and trap music. Yeah, that's not my, that's like really not my skill set, to be honest. Uh, there's a million. Okay, so this is something important, uh, Diego. Um, have you looked up like tutorials on how to make trap music? Not within Friday Night Funkin'. You realize there's trap music outside of Friday Night Funkin', right? So like, go learn how to make trap music for real outside of Friday Night Funkin', and then put the funny Matt vocals over top of it and whatever. But like, you can study these genres outside of Friday Night Funkin', and you should. These genres have existed long before this little game did, right? Song breakdowns. Yeah, I want to do that. That'd be fun. Because uh, I have the... I mean, lots of producers have released the files to their songs. The FLPs. Um, Rosebud dropped all the uh, the tricky Ableton files, which is fun. Yeah, this tutorial wasn't even Friday Night Funkin'. I, I specifically avoided making it Friday Night Funkin', even though I put the characters on the thumbnail. Sorry for the clickbait there. Intruder. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're going to do that Friday. We're going to go through the tracks for Intruder. Uh, also, I think in the morning we're going to play Multiverses. That could be fun. Um, I might even play with some viewers if I'm if I'm feeling up to it. We'll see how that goes. How could you make a fan song about Sonic? Uh, I mean, you write whatever style song you want, and then you write some lyrics about Sonic. That's all I'm doing for the Sonic.exe song. Most fun Friday Night Funkin' song to cover. Uh, Discharge. Absolutely. Had a blast with that. <laughs> you let me know when you're live, Tercero, and then I'll hop on. We'll send everyone over. I could join the. I know, but I don't. I, I want to send people over when you're live, Tercero. Let me know. Gotta go fast. I got them here. Are you live now? Sweet. Looks like it. Do I know what's happening with all? I haven't heard from her for a while, actually. Yes. All right. Everyone go hop over to Tercero's stream. Tercero and I are going to play some Geo Guesser, Geotastic over there. It's going to be fun. I'll see y'all over there, okay? If I could raid from YouTube to Twitch, I would, but we can't do that. So everyone go. Let's go raid Khan Schaller. Come on. Would I cover any witty songs if I could? No, I don't like witty songs. I'm sorry. They kind of bore me. All right. Thank y'all so much for watching. Had a wonderful evening. We're going to do a lot more. And uh, I'll see y'all later. Have a good night. I'll see y'all in the morning. Uh, but first, I'll see you all over on Tercero's stream. Head over to twitch.tv slash We linked it in the chat. We'll see you there.